Hello everyone and welcome back to Towergate. It is Towergate Day 1003-1003, Friday, January the 3rd, 2020. Thank you so much for tuning in. Okay, so let's go ahead and get to the news of the day here. Uh, so there's a story in Gateway Pundit yesterday uh, about our good friend, Evelyn Farkas. Remember Evelyn Farkinus? <laughs> I'm sure many of you remember her. If not, Google her, Google her and you'll remember it'll... Uh, snap your memory back very quickly. <laughs> she is the one who went on TV on, uh, I think it was with uh, Mika Brzezinski back in March of 2017 and admitted that the Obama administration was spying on the Trump campaign. Now, at the time, she was the Assistant Secretary of Defense. And uh, so this story from the Gateway Pundit uh, uh, shows her in a picture literally wearing a Burisma uniform. <laughs> she's wearing a Burisma uniform. She's in Ukraine. So there she is in Ukraine in a Burisma uniform, standing there uh, with a member of the Atlantic Council, which of course we all know the Atlantic Council is closely connected to uh, all these um, uh, European anti-Trump people, uh, specifically, they're also, the Atlantic Council is sort of a, a aligned, joined at the hip with CrowdStrike. And the guys who run CrowdStrike, all part of that Atlantic Council and that whole nine yards. So, um, and of course, there's a lot of American officials, associated, Victoria Newland and others associated with the Atlantic Council. We all know who these people are. Um, and, of course, remember that Evelyn Farkinus also went on in the 2016 Hillary Clinton campaign to be a, an advisor, an advisor to the rotten Reverend Clinton and her campaign in 2016 and was slated to have a fairly uh, high-level job in the Hillary Clinton administration had she won the presidency. But then, uh, now, this is obviously, you know, something that, people will be paying attention to, uh, maybe want to ask her some questions. There she is in Ukraine, literally wearing a Burisma uniform with a guy from the Atlantic Council also wearing his Burisma uniform. And uh, so that story probably is interesting enough to where some people may want to look into it. Uh, maybe like someone like Rudy Giuliani. But let's not forget, because a lot of people focused on that... <clears throat> on that March 2017 interview that uh, Farkinus did with Mika Brzezinski. But she did another interview two months later in May of 2017. And in that interview, she said, quote, if the Trump folks find out what we knew about the Trump staff dealing with Russians, they would try to compromise the sources and methods meaning that we would no longer have access to that intelligence. Let me say that again. She's on a, a liberal network in May of 2017, two months after her first appearance where she admits of spying on the Trump campaign. In the second appearance, she says that the Trump folks find out what we knew about them, the Trump staff, dealing with Russians, they might try to compromise the sources and methods meaning that we would no longer have access to that intelligence. Well, what is she saying here? She's saying that they have to hide, hide what they're doing. And that goes directly to that January 5th meeting in the White House. That's what that was all about. It's like, oh, okay, so what do we do? Trump's going to come in in two weeks. He's going to be inaugurated. He's going to come in in two weeks. And we've got this investigation about on him and his campaign going on. How's that going to work? Well, obviously, we have to keep that information from him. We can't let him know that he and his campaign are under investigation. So we have to hide that, and we have to make sure that they don't find out, and as she says here, um, because they might try to compromise the sources and the methods, meaning we would no longer have access to that influence. Well, what would she be talking about there? Sources and methods. What were the sources? <laughs> huh? What, what were the sources? The so-called Steele dossier? And what were the methods? 
using private contractors to access the uh, NSA database through the FBI uh, to get uh, all those people in a, in a net um, who were in the Trump campaign so that Rice and others could unmask them? Is that what she was talking about? I do believe so. Now keep in mind, Evelyn Farkinus is now running for Congress. Please don't vote for her. So there you go. She's making a comeback and, and it's, uh, you know, someone should be asking some serious questions about that and I'm sure that Rudy Giuliani will probably get right on that. Good old Evelyn Farkinus. <clears throat> well, let's uh, stop in and uh, pay a visit to the demo commies running for president and see what's going on with them today or what was going on with them yesterday. Well, it appears that uh, Burisma Joe Biden has dumped his slogan, no malarkey, because it really didn't work very well. It's kind of stupid, too. And it also shows his age and how out of touch he is. No one really uses the term malarkey much anymore. Now we just say bullshit. So, <clears throat> he would have been better off if he would have put no bullshit up on the side of his bus. At least it would have drawn some attention to him, and he would have sounded relative. But instead, he opted for no malarkey, and then he went out and proceeded to give nothing but malarkey and bullshit. So now he has uh, taken that off of his tour bus, and now he has up on his bus battle for the soul of the nation. <laughs> so he's going to try to now frame the campaign. The Biden campaign is going to try to frame it as the battle for the soul of the nation. Boy, I don't know about you, but I'm worried about my soul. Millions and millions of Americans across the country really concerned about their soul. But thank God Joe Biden is here to save our souls. That's essentially what he wants us to believe, that he can save our souls from Trump. <laughs> I don't think this is going to work either. I don't think this is going to work. Really, nothing's going to work for, for Burisma Joe. Um, but he'll, you know, he, he will likely, unless the rotten Reverend Clinton throws her hat in the ring, he will likely be the nominee. And uh, that's not going to go over very well with the far left wing, progressive wing of the party. And they'll probably revolt at the convention. We'll get back to that in a moment. Now, we also have Andy McCabe making his legal argument in court yesterday. You're not going to believe this. So, in regards to his lying four times, um, his, his response to why he lied was that, uh, that he was surprised by the question. <laughs> so, if you're surprised by a question, you just naturally lie about it. I guess. But no, he's making in his legal, legal argument um, that because he was the head of the FBI at the time, that he was allowed to lie. <laughs> that is literally the legal argument he is making for why he lied. Hey, I'm head of the FBI. I'm allowed to lie. <laughs> to the inspector general conducting an investigation about illegal activities that went on at the FBI. And remember how pissed off, it's no wonder that they, that they fired him. Uh, remember, the IG comes to McCabe, interviews him, and they've already interviewed three or four other people. They've pretty much narrowed it down and uh, pretty sure it had to be McCabe. They come and interview him. He lies to them. So they go back scratching their head going, damn, so it wasn't McCabe. Well, who else could it have been? So they have to go digging and digging and interviewing, re-interviewing people over and over again to see if they missed something. Delayed them, caused them a lot of problems, a lot of frustration. But they eventually come back to the same thing. Then, of course, Lisa Page, eventually they re-interview her. And she says, hey, I've got, I've got emails and texts. I can prove what I'm telling you is true. She produces this evidence and they go back to McCabe. Now they know 100% sure. Uh, and they tell him, hey, look, last time we came here, you lied to us. We now have evidence that proves that you lied to us. Do you want to own up to this or not? <laughs> and then he did. 
And he says that the reason he initially lied because he was surprised by the question. Uh, he, he didn't expect to be asked the question. <laughs> is that is, is if that's an excuse, which it's not. And then he literally makes a legal argument. His attorney uh, makes a legal argument, Mr. Bromwich. And where, what's the last? When's the last time we saw Mr. Bromwich? Uh, he was defending uh, what's her name uh, in the Kavanaugh hearings, um, the crazy woman, defending the crazy woman in the Kavanaugh hearings. He was one of uh, he was one of her uh, uh, legal counsel. Now he's representing Andy McCabe, and he's making the case to the court that. Uh, he shouldn't have been fired because as uh, the acting director of the FBI at the time, he had the right to lie <laughs> to the inspector general. Alrighty, I don't think that's going to fly. How about you? Now, and in terms of his argument as far as why he was wrongfully fired, and of course he's trying to get, I don't know if he's trying to get his job back, but he's trying to get his benefits. Uh, and he's trying to get, you know, that sort of thing. So, He's, his argument in that particular point is that he was wrongfully fired because Trump called him a dirty cop. <laughs> he literally is trying to make the case to the court that he was fired wrongfully because Trump called him a dirty cop. <laughs> no, it's because you lied to the IG four times. You leaked stories to the Wall Street Journal. Um, and you co-opted two other people to assist you in that and lied about it after you were asked. You lied four times. And a lot of other things that you're involved in that the IG is aware of that Mr. Durham's investigating right now. So there you go. These people are absolute idiots. Idiots, I'm telling you. Um, you know, I mean, for a long time, I thought these were pretty smart guys uh, that just believed that uh, Hillary would win and they would never have to worry about this being investigated. But the more and more that we learn from the IG report and from other information that's come out, you can only conclude that these guys really weren't all that smart, quite honestly. I mean, these guys weren't that smart, okay? Let's just, and, and when you see this kind of a legal defense, yeah, I got wrongfully fired because Trump called me a dirty cop. <laughs> yeah, um, I shouldn't have been fired because I'm, uh, I was the head of the FBI at the time, the acting director, and therefore I'm allowed to lie, even if it's to the inspector general doing an investigation into possible corruption in the FBI by the leadership. <laughs> I mean, this guy, whew, he's going to lose. He's going to lose on both counts. Um, Peter's been stroking us. is definitely going to lose his, his uh, lawsuit, as is um, Lisa, Lisa Page. <clears throat> Let's see. Oh, here we have a couple of uh, updates on more demo commies dropping out of the race. We now have Julian Castro dropping out. Uh, he raised a grand total of $7 million throughout the entire season. And I don't think he even was on the radar as far as did he even have 1%? I don't think so. Uh, so he's obviously out. Uh, and we hear that Marianne Williamson has laid off all of her campaign team. Well, if you've laid off your entire campaign team, you're pretty much out of it. I already thought they were both out of it anyway. I mean, they haven't qualified for any of the last two or three debates. And Marianne Williamson is the only one who's actually somewhat entertaining, worth even watching the debate for. If she's in the debate, I might tune in for a little while. You know, that might actually have some entertainment value. But, um, yeah, without Marianne Williamson, I mean, shh, why bother? Well, it looks like the Rotten Reverend Clinton uh, has uh, grifted her way into a new job. It appears that she's now been named the Chancellor of Queen's University in Northern Ireland. <laughs> what does that mean? Well, it means that she really doesn't have to actually do anything, but she'll go there a couple times a year and give some speeches and pick up a big, fat check. That's what the Rotten Reverend Clinton does because she's a grifter. She'll go make a couple of speeches while a bunch of uh, Euro commies kiss her fat white ass. And then she'll walk out the door, colostomy bag in hand, along with a big fat check. The grifter. I was kind of hoping it was an actual job there in Ireland. That way, we wouldn't have to worry about her anymore being over here. 
I would much prefer the Rotten Reverend Clinton move to Ireland and run the damn school into the ground, just like Bernie's wife did. But no, it's only sort of a, um, it's, 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 it's sort of a, it's not a real position, you know, it's not a real job. There is no real job for her to do. It's just that the, that they can use her name to try to attract uh, more kids to come there so they can uh, most likely raise tuition prices because now they can say that Hillary Clinton is on their cadre and that will justify the big fat check that the Rotten Reverend Clinton is going to pocket a couple times a year when she goes over to make a speech. There you go. The, the grifter. The Rotten Reverend. <clears throat> well, it looks like um, uh, Liawatha, Elizabeth Warren, has dropped her Medicare for All agenda. <laughs> I, I guess that's a good idea. A little late, don't you think? A little late. First of all, it was Bernie's plan that she stole. I mean, if it would have been her own plan, we could at least say, well, at least she came up with a plan. But she didn't even come up with her own plan. She stole Bernie's plan. At least Bernie came out and said, yeah, I'm going to raise everybody's taxes to pay for my Medicare bill. So she steals Bernie's plan but she refuses to say that she's going to raise everybody's taxes. Now, Bernie's standing there going, wait a minute. Your Medicare plan is exactly like mine. You're going to have to raise taxes on everybody. <laughs> but she would never admit it. And then finally, after getting beat up day after day after day after day, now for the past month, longer than that, actually, she's finally had to quit talking about her Medicare for all plan. It pretty much doomed her, though. I mean, it did. So, she's out of there. I don't think dropping that Medicare for All uh, plan from her agenda is going to save her now. I think it's a little too little, a little too late. Say goodbye to Liawatha. We also get some more uh, entertaining news. Uh, it appears that the state of New York is going to lose two seats. They're going to lose two congressional seats. And so, the heads of the Democratic Party up in New York are looking at which two voting districts they might want to let go of. <laughs> and guess which one they're targeting the hardest. Yes, you guessed it. The voting district of Ocasio-Cortez. <laughs> they want to get rid of Ocasio-Cortez? Here's how you do it. And why are they looking at her district specifically, according to them? Well, it's because right now, the Trump administration is in the process of purging uh, illegals from the voter rolls. And we know that her district, 25% of the people in Ocasio-Cortez's district are illegals. And a lot of them apparently voted. And they're going to be knocked off the voter rolls. So likely, uh, it's not going to be a very good district to have around anyway. Could even go Republican. So it looks like they're targeting her voting district to be one of the two that they're going to get rid of. <laughs> Just like they did Kucinich. When the Democratic Party wants to get rid of you, that's how they get rid of you. They get rid of your voting district. <laughs> say goodbye to Ocasio-Cortez. She's about to get uh, delisted, you might say. <clears throat> well, as many of you know, I've been talking for weeks and weeks and weeks about how when I look at the Democrat race as it's shaping up, I keep saying it doesn't look like to me that there's going to be any clear uh, majority uh, winner here. You're not going to find any one of those candidates that are going to get 51%. Because as you look at the first five or six primaries, it's, it's hard to imagine any one of those people uh, in the top four winning two or more of those primaries. Bernie will probably win New Hampshire. But he probably won't win Iowa. Who might win Iowa? Maybe uh, Pocahontas, but that's all she'll win. Who's going to win California? Well, not Pocahontas. Okay, uh, who, so who might win there? Biden? I don't know. Maybe. It's pretty far left, progressive. Maybe Bernie wins that. Hard to say. But once they get into the southern states, Bernie hits, hits a roadblock. He, he can't win in the south. So Bernie is strong in the upper Midwest, on the east coast, and he might have some play out on the west coast. So he's, he's a very regional candidate. 
Warren is the same way. Uh, and, and Biden is sort of the candidate that you vote for if you're a moderate Democrat and there's just no one else to vote for. And he's all you've got. He's, all, he's sort of like the default. Okay, but he's probably not going to win Iowa. He's probably not going. He's certainly not going to win New Hampshire. I can't imagine him winning there. I don't know if he'll win California. I don't. I don't. Now he might. He probably win South Carolina. That's probably the only place he will win. But what you're looking at, either way, and I realized this a couple of well, quite a few weeks ago, a month, two months ago, that you're likely looking at a brokered convention. And of course, this favors the Democratic Party. Because in a brokered convention, they'll all go to the convention. They'll realize that no one has a clear majority. And so they will first have a vote, which will not include the superdelegates. They're out of the first vote. So they have kind of a revote. It's, it's more to establish exactly where they are. And it will almost always confirm what is already known. Okay, You're not generally going to see a, a big difference. Okay, So it will likely confirm that there simply is no clear front runner. You might see a movement here of a point to point or two here and there, but largely it's going to be pretty much what you got when you when you when you arrive there. It's not going to change very much. So they're going to have a vote. The super delegates can't vote the first time around, but then when they see there's no clear majority after that first vote, now it's open season. Anyone's name can be brought forward, even if they never competed in a single primary, even if they uh, haven't filed any paperwork, even if they haven't competed in a single debate. Doesn't matter. Once they have the first vote and there's no clear uh, majority, 51% or better, at that point, it's wide open and they can advance anyone's name in for nomination. And the, then once they do that, then they have a vote and then the super delegates get to vote and they will decide who the Democrat nominee is going to be. And if the rotten Reverend Clinton is going to make a play, it's going to be there. And she will likely have her people there trying to make the argument for her uh, to uh, make her the nominee. And I think it's going to be a, a tough road to hoe for her because she didn't compete in any primaries or anything like that. It will depend on how badly damaged Biden is by then. I think that that's ultimately what's going to happen. If Biden is, is still standing on his feet, he might be, you know, completely psycho. Uh, he might be mumbling God knows what, but if he is standing there, if he's still in the race, if he still has some fundraising going on, if he's not been indicted or something or whatever, uh, he will likely be the person that the party will feel that they have to get behind. Um, I, 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 I think the Rotten Reverend still has a hardcore group of people who will push for her and try to put her name in for nomination. But I think there's going to be a lot of pushback. She's going to try as hard as she can, but I'm not 100% sure. In fact, I am 100% sure that not everyone is going to be pulling for Hillary. So I would say that she is going to try to pull that off, but I don't think she's going to get away with it because I think the blowback from the Democrat, the voters, um, I think the blowback is potentially bad enough that they'll be afraid that if they do that, they put in Hillary, uh, that the blowback from the Biden campaign, from the Sanders campaign, from their supporters, from people who, d who didn't want to go with Hillary again or whatever, I think, I think it's going to be very difficult. But I think the rotten Reverend Clinton is going to do everything she can to make that happen. But I think she's going to come up short. But she's sure going to give it a try. And I think that that's what we're going to see in the Democratic convention. Remember, the last time that the Democrats had a broker convention, uh, 1968, it was a disaster, needless to say. They ended up electing a very, very, very far left, George McGovern, who got totally destroyed. So, uh, yeah, I think that that's kind of what we're looking at. And now, of course, we are seeing some media pundits now starting to talk about the same thing. Yeah, it's starting to look like a broker convention. Yeah, well, you know, it was looking like a broker convention almost two months ago to me, maybe even before that. I can't remember how long ago it was I started talking about that. But, you know, it just when you look at that field, there is no, there's no Barack Obama in the field. That, that person isn't there. And not a single one of those candidates, uh, when you look at them, they have too many weaknesses. Each of them have too many weaknesses and none of them is strong 
everywhere in the country where they need to be. Uh, they have certain strengths in certain areas, but it's like regional. So I don't think the same person that can win New, New Hampshire will win Iowa, will be the same person that will win California, will be the same person that will win South Carolina. I think those are all going to be different winners. So, um, and then of course, you know, you got Buddy, Buddy Gig, who's rising. Warren is falling, but she's still higher than he is. At some point, they'll reach equilibrium. Sanders has hit his ceiling. Now he has a floor and he has a ceiling, and I think he's at his ceiling. I don't think he goes much higher. Uh, and Biden, I think, is just the default. And I don't think that. I don't think that when the caucus goers and primary goers show up to vote, that that's where their passion is. That their passion is not with Biden. Their passion is with maybe Bernie or maybe Warren or maybe Buttigieg. Biden is like the default. He's like, okay, well, if no one else can do it, I guess we're stuck with Biden. I, I, that's kind of how it looks to me. But we'll wait and see. But I do agree with the pundits, or I should say they now agree with me, that a brokered convention is the most likely scenario that we're looking at for the demo commies in 2020. <clears throat> and we have Klobuchar saying that uh, if she's president, she's going to uh, uh, get out information about UFOs. <laughs> Yeah. Uh-huh. <laughs> yes, well, uh, Klobuchar is an idiot. Um, no, she will not get any information on UFOs or what the government knows about any of that type of stuff because other presidents have tried, and uh, basically they're told you don't have a need to know, and curiosity is not a need to know. That type of stuff, those type of secrets are held within the most secretive parts of our government and even the President of the United States isn't going to get that type of information. And uh, it's really a silly campaign promise, to be honest with you. Um, because quite honestly, not that many people care. I mean, yeah, I mean, I think I think most people know by now the fact that the Navy has actually admitted that their pilots are locking onto these things, that they are real, that they are around, they've been around, they know they've been around, they don't know what the hell they are. They're unidentified flying objects. They've been around for a long time. Everybody knows it. Uh, what they know about them, I, I think they don't know that much about them, which is why they don't want to talk about it. If they knew a lot about them, they probably would uh, um, come out with some sort of a defensive mechanism and they would explain to us what, what that is for and what it's all about. But um, <clears throat> they don't know. <clears throat> they have no idea. But um, I don't need... Klobuchar or the government to come out and tell me anything about UFOs. Uh, I think we all know that uh, there's, these things have been flying around for a very long time. It's, uh, you know, very, very, very long time. So, whoop de doo Well, we know that uh, Mr. Potato Head John Brennan told Trey Gowdy in the hearings that the dossier was not part of the ICA, the Intelligence Community Assessment. One of the major reasons, there's many reasons, but one of the major reasons probably that Durham is going to be charging uh, Brennan is because literally you have both Clapper and Mike Rogers disputing Brennan. Both Clapper and Mike Rogers are disputing Brennan when Brennan says, or when Brennan said, under oath to Trey Gowdy, which he should probably be charged for lying to Congress, and I'm sure he will, that the dossier was not part of the ICA. We all know it was part of the ICA. In fact, it was most of the ICA. We know all about it. Clapper's admitted to it. Mike Rogers, not only did Mike Rogers just admit to it, but after the hearings, he was so disturbed by Brennan lying about it that he wrote a letter, a classified letter to Congress to say, hey, I just want to let you know. When Brennan was testifying and he said that the uh, dossier didn't have anything to do with our discussions about you know, the intelligence community assessment, uh, Russia thing. Uh, well, yeah, it was discussed. In fact, it was most of what we were talking about. He lied. So Mike Rogers blew the whistle on uh, Mr. Potato Head a long time ago. Shortly after the hearings were over, he, he wanted to make sure he didn't get caught up with these guys. He wanted to say, hey, I'll just to let you know, I want to go on the record. When Brennan told you that the ICA had nothing to do with the dossier, <laughs> let me tell you, I was in the meetings with him and Comey. Yeah. And Clapper. Yeah. It was mostly what they were talking about. <laughs> and Brennan now has that letter. Oh, yes. 
Brennan has the classified letter that Mike Rogers gave to Congress, letting them know that he was in the meetings with Clapper and Comey and Brennan, and it was all about the dossier. Brennan lied through his teeth to Trey Gowdy and the Congress under oath. <clears throat> Papagopoulos has tweeted out that there is a transcript of his conversation with Alexander Down the Hatch Downer that he and, and Pops says that he was recording me. He says that Durham certainly has the transcript of that conversation. He said that conversation will prove that the Australian government was spying on me and the Trump campaign. And one other thing, uh, many of you have seen that picture of Down the Hatch Downer and Stefan Halper, the fat man, at a event in Cambridge where Halper is up at the microphone speaking and Down the Hatch Downer is sitting in the chair next to the podium. I assume either he's already spoken or waiting to speak. But we never really knew much more about that photo, when it was taken, the context of anything else. Well, now we know. Now we know. That photo of Halper and Downer together at Cambridge was taken approximately one week before Downer approached Papagopoulos. The photo was taken of Halper and Downer about one week before Downer approached Papagopoulos. <laughs> what a beauty. Good news. Uh, the Trump administration is now cleaning out the House, cleaning the House at the National Security Council, which is very important because that's where a lot of this garbage and leaks was coming from. And under Obama, there were 450 people in the NSC, many of them all around the White House. Sharamella and uh, this Colonel Vindman were both uh, two of those 450 people. So they say that they're cleaning house at that NSC. They're going to reduce the number of staff from 450 down to 120. There will be new people brought in. The old people will be sent away. Sharmella is already gone. Sharmella has already been sent packing from the NSC, and you can bet that Vindman is not far behind. They're getting ready to drain the swamp in the White House, which is the NSC. Well done. And we have the Daily Beast reporting, and there, this, this is an article that's really in defense of Mr. Potato Head, but in the process of being in defense of Mr. Potato Head, they expose something that's probably you'd be interested in knowing. So we learned that John Durham uh, had told um, the CIA that he wants all of Brennan's emails, communications, and various uh, other information. But we're learning now that it's not just uh, that he's getting this information uh, that the CIA has on John Brennan, but Durham is also getting all the private phone records, bank records, travel records of John Brennan. Not just his work-related stuff, but his private phone records, bank records, and travel records. That's important because what do we know? We know that Brennan and Clapper and Comey, after they left office, and during this past summer, spent a lot of time jet-setting around the globe, going to some of the places where a lot of this activity went on. In fact, we know that Comey actually showed up in Australia, uh, and Misfit had just been there the same week. So it looks like these guys are going back to these places where they were involved in this scam and trying to cover up their tracks. So this travel information, and I assume that he's going to be getting this information on all these guys, Clapper, Brennan, Comey, the whole nine yards. But it's not just his government-related stuff. It's everything. His personal records, travel records, phone records, bank records. Thank you so much for tuning in. I'll be back tomorrow with more Towergate. See you. Bye.